Hello. <clears throat> so I'm going to read through the third will section, which is nicknamed uh, Philistine. And I'll admit, I don't know, I'm feeling just a little bit off today. Um, maybe I'm just 3 effing a little bit, but uh, hopefully I can get through this with a little bit of enthusiasm. Um, <clears throat> but just warning you. Okay, so I made this big preface last time um, for two, uh, excuse me, for um, uh, 2v, second will. And I would just say, like, if you haven't listened to that preface and for some reason you're skipping around these sections, um, I would say, like, go listen to that first and then just apply everything um, to uh, third will, but in the opposite way. Um, what I think, in my, in my opinion, based on my understanding of typologies and psychosophy and attitudinal psyche and whatnot, I think volition, what it really is, is this thing I call potentia, which is about being able to see potential in things, in people, in situations, um, and summon and muster energy to act on that potential to change things um, and to judge i'm not really judge in like um an analytical way but to kind of sense or intuit uh the potential power of something else and it's its ability to change things and for th third wills um because they're they're self-doubting about that they're weak but they're also um, skeptical of the the influence of the other, the non-self. Uh, they are insecure, and so they feel as though that their their attitude, their orientation, is that they don't really know what the potential of things are. They don't know what their own potential is, their own power. So they're neurotic about their their ability to shape the future and about the ability of other people to shape the future. Um, and so they're continually in a kind of, you know, neurotic way, although with maturation, it might not always be neurotic, but um, they tend towards this uh, neurotic uh, fear about power, but also, a, you know, a, a feeling that they have to do something in regards to power because they can't trust other people. Like a 4V is just like, ah, just, you know, you take the, you take the wheel, right? You can be the captain. But for 3Vs, they're like, no, like, you know, they're insecure about their own ability to steer, steer the ship, but they also don't really want anyone else to be doing it. Um, so that's essentially, that's the core nature of third. But it's like their, their potent, their potentia is out of whack. Their ability to like intuit how things are going to go not necessarily their actual capacity for that but the feeling that they have the like he says the internal perception of these functions their perception is that um, or their attitude their orientation is that they can't they can't judge the future they don't know how things are going to go so a lot of a lot of that feeds into like power complexes and our understanding of power because you know, all of us have to kind of negotiate how the future is going to turn out because there's some futures that are, going to, that are going to be worse for you and better for other people, right? And so we're always kind of like, you know, dishing out and trying to distribute and negotiate power. Um, and third wills are kind of neurotic and anxious about that. So if you understand that, then you can see where he's going with third will, but he kind of goes in this very dramatic direction um yeah i kind of in a little bit i mean yeah I, I don't want to make any comparisons to other typologies right now but yeah it's kind of like their intuition about the future is out of whack and that has implications about their feelings of power and who's at the wheel you know who's steering things the, the feeling of like control about where things are going um so, let's get into it. Uh, Philistine, Third Will. Uh, starting my story about the Third Will, I immediately want to warn. Here we are entering the darkest and most painful circle of the life of the human spirit. Therefore, I apologize in advance to readers with the Third Will, 
for the frankness with which I have to talk about the hidden and painful side of their existence. Uh, every third function is divided and wounded. The special tragedy of the position of the Philistine lies in the fact that it is his will that is wounded, the support of the personality, that on which the entire order of functions rests. And when the support is weakened and injured, the entire edifice of the human psyche becomes shaky and vulnerable. Life becomes a chronic nightmare. Even weak blows and just a touch of any, not just the third, function can shake the being of the Philistine to the core, knocking out the third will. So in other words, like even weak blows to other functions um, can affect the third will's kind of insecureness, insecurity. Uh, total vulnerability is the distinctive and most frightening feature of the psyche of the Philistine. It makes the third will look like a mollusk with the most tender and defenseless body which nature has denied a shell and thus doomed from the cradle to the grave to anger, aggressiveness, secrecy, and loneliness. Now, I don't know about all that, but if you can kind of like walk that back or kind of like rein that in about, you know, 20 to 30 percent, it's like someone who they're insecure about their future and about the way their future is going to go. And that, that affects things that if you just hear that, you might not immediately think that it affects power, but it does, as I explained previously. And so that has, it has like knock on implications. Um, and mostly he's talking about those implications, but I don't feel he does justice to what I believe um, the core idea is. But then again, my belief is a little bit like syncretist and a little bit heterodox. So <clears throat> yeah, I'm not blaming him for not knowing what my superior uh, opinion is, but I hope you guys are kind of like getting what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying here. Okay. Uh, you must have a lot of mental health in order to look without fear into the abyss that is the soul of the Philistine. Dostoevsky's novels are only a fate reflection of the hell in which the third will chronically lives, because he types Dostoevsky as a, I believe, an EFVL. Uh, same type as Pushkin. Uh, the term complex is truly only applicable to the psyche of the Philistine since it really represents a whole complex of sores, burns, and ulcers threatening to grow into one multifunctional festering wound. Therefore, the means of self-defense of the third will have the form of a complex universal set. If the reader remembers, each third function has its own fig leaf, uh, meaning kind of a, like Adam and Eve, they hid their private, their genitals with fig leaves, I think. And so a fig leaf is kind of your, your protective, cover that you're kind of uh your false mask that you're trying to cover up your your insecurity your shame the third will also has it this is hypo hypocrisy and foolishness but since the entire order of functions of the philistine is vulnerable he has to cover himself entirely with the entire fan of existing fig leaves now acting like a fool now being hypocritical now ironizing which i believe is like being ironic um now falling into the deepest skepticism or, like, not just uh, being ironic intentionally, but accidentally doing things that are ironic, okay? The image of a naked mollusk with the most tender, vulnerable body sneaking through life as if, as if through a serpentarium, which I don't even know what a serpentarium is. Um, in a camouflage, I'm guessing it's something to do with, like, snakes. <laughs> uh, in a camouflage coat of fig leaves is the image that quite accurately conveys the state of the inner life of the third will. One of the typical derivatives of the mental state of the third will is that, feeling how the will bends and cracks under the weight of other functions, it tries to shift the gra center of gravity of the personality to the clearly palpable, redundant first function. Okay, so he's, he's um, offering this hypothesis that third will types seem to over rely on their first function so that's that's interesting i don't know if that's true but you know it's worth considering it turns out something uh, similar to a person who instead of walking on a rope bridge of four functions prefers to walk on one rope according to the first function believing that one rope uh that is reliable is better than four especially if you make it thicker okay um so they're kind of putting all their eggs in one basket uh, balancing on one first function leads to the fact that the Philistine striving to strengthen and strengthen the first artificially hypertrophies it, already hypertrophied to such a degree that those around him begin to classify the state of the Philistine as madness. So the first function is already somewhat, you know, too excessive, too brittle, um, you know, too pumped up. And so they're doing that even more. And so it becomes like a sort of, you know, you know neurotic overdone thing. 
Before speaking about the first functions, I already had to mention that the certain deviations are associated with them in psychiatry. Now the time has come to say that the majority of this risk group are Philistines. The combination of first emotion with third will gives manic depressive psychosis. The combination of first logic with third will gives paranoia. The combination of first physics with third will, pathological stinginess and cruelty. Uh, the mechanism, and he really has it out for uh, first physics and third will. He, those, those types, uh, FLVE and FEVL, um, just get the absolute most dire descriptions, um, especially FLVE. Uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to read the type descriptions because I just, they're honestly not very, they're not, I mean, they're fun to read, but they're not very useful. And it's just straight up, like some types are like angels and others are like devils, you know? And I don't think that it's going to be, it's not going to be helpful for people typing themselves and other people to read the descriptions. It's better to just look at them as kind of like a, you know, a historical part of the way this theory is gradually developing um <clears throat> okay the mechanism of these deviations is simple a person strives without relying on the wounded will to make even more redundant and reliable what is already redundant and reliable for him thereby falling into such an overload that psychiatry begins to interpret his state of mind as pathology although i repeat the list of deviations are more psychotypical phenomena phenomena than psychiatric ones okay it is extremely difficult to describe the, insert, the internal state of the third will, so it is better to refer to the document. Here are excerpts from a letter from one young Philistine, remarkable in that its author not only constantly feels a hidden flaw in himself, uh, but also tries to analyze its origins. I look through my past and present, and it turned out that I am a meager facelessness. Aware of my facelessness, I suspected this before, but now I'm not sure. I've never had friends, or rather, I had one one in the second grade, but then we became friends. Uh, and everyone laughed at me. I mean my peers, but for some reason my thoughts, I always considered myself better than all of them. Everything was different in life. I don't have the strength to finish the lesson. I constantly think about myself or daydream, and in my dreams I'm usually strong, strong-willed, and purposeful, not like in life. I didn't do anything in sports, although I did rowing for five years. I achieved good results in training. But as soon as the competition came, I showed the worst results. I feel awkward and around people. I hide my eyes in front of passers-by, as, uh, as if I were guilty of something in front of them. I can't help it. In recent years, around 7th seventh, seventh to 8th grade, I began to feel very awkward in, awkward in class. I felt that I had no friend, and those classmates to whom I was drawn did not pay attention to me, and I suffered. Why didn't I change my mind? Now, looking back, I understand that I never had my own face. I always followed someone else, someone's lead, and in general, I have the feeling that I don't feel anything. Uh, I don't know how to get angry, laugh from the heart. I don't know how. I can't or don't know how to be friends, but I really want to have a friend. When people scold me, I have absolutely nothing to say against. I feel like there's something wrong with me. I don't have any strength. My ethics teacher told me that character tendencies are inherited from parents. Then maybe I'm spineless from my father. He hasn't lived with us for, mo for a long time, but his mother said that he was an alcoholic and a weak-willed person, but my mother is strong with character. How to live. Every day it gets harder and harder. Such is the confession, a kind of mournful list of the torments of the third will. There is no point in commenting on every word of the letter now. Much more will have to be said later about the specifics of the psychology of the Philistine. Uh, so, again, because their potentia is insecure, it's not just the the, potent, the potential of you know things and events and other people. It's also it's also their own potential. So third wills don't feel like they have a solid identity, right? It feels because it's it's process, right? It's fluctuating, right? But it's not like so two v second will is also processing and it's also fluctuating. But there's it's like an adapt. It's flexible. It's adaptable. It's like a it's a it's a fun processing. It's a uh, fearless and exciting and playful uh, state of kind of becoming and transformation, right? And seeing that potentials, you know, changing and shifting in other people, right? That's flexible volition. But for insecure volition, um, for third will, uh, there's this feeling of just, you know, brittleness and fear, okay? 
and the lack of solidity and not knowing where the future is going to go, not knowing where you're going to go, etc. Okay. Lies are the earliest sign. Oh, sorry. Lies are the earliest and surest sign of the third will. I will not say that other volition types never lie. Uh, it happens, but only out of great need. The situation is di different with the third will. She lies often, automatically, impulsively, stupidly, and meaninglessly. For the Philistine, a lie is the universal weapon of self-defense and self-affirmation, and therefore is revealed at the first imaginary or real threat, as well as the, at the first opportunity to show off. The third will is too vulnerable, too sensitive to public opinion, not to try to protect the wounded core of its nature with lies. If for a noble man, human assessments can only scratch the surface of his being, of his powerful being, then for a Philistine, every opinion, whether ne positive or negative, causes a shaking of the foundations, worries to the depths, depths of the soul. So again, like kind of like walk it back, maybe like, you know, 20 to 30 percent. And, you, you know, it's somewhat accurate. Uh, pretense, hypocrisy, or more directly, hypocrisy, <laughs> just translation garbage there, um, is an integral part of the same tendency of the third will to lie. Uh, the Philistine is afraid to show up to reveal himself, preferring to look like someone, el someone uh, else, more often a person, more socially significant than to be himself. Dostoevsky wrote, we are all ashamed of ourselves. Indeed, each of us carries within himself almost innate shame for himself and for his own person. And barely in society, all Russian people immediately try to quickly as possible and at all costs certainly appear to be something else, but not what he really is. Everyone is in a hurry to take on a completely different face. Face. Excuse me. Uh, the third will is a born theater actor, which is better called not social, but hierarchical because the Philistine acts not only in society, but also in the family. So that's interesting. Once again, He's referring to actors outside of the context of um, emotion. Because remember, he calls second emotion actor. And he, you know, paints this portrait of them that makes sense in that regard. But now he's saying Third Will is also a born theater actor. So, I don't know. He, it's kind of an analogy he, he maybe overuses. Um, and then it gets more confusing because he also said that uh, first emotion types are act are more like actors in the theater uh, rather than film actors which are more like 2e yeah it gets it gets very confusing with all the actor analogies um i would just kind of take each one in its own context and then it's a, it makes a little more sense so the third will is a born theater actor just because they're always their identity is in flux you know they don't they have this insecurity of identity so they learn to wear like they compensate by kind of putting on airs and like wearing masks and not being who they truly are. Um, but it's not so much social, it's hierarchical. So they, um, they act not only out in society, but also in the family. And as we'll talk about in politics too. I'm going to take a sip. So he also calls third will bourgeois. I don't think that's fitting because the connotation of bourgeois, um, oftentimes uh, due to the influence of you know Marxism, um, is usually like an economic connotation, and it has a lot more to do with like physics, right? It's not, but he means it in as in like the kind of middling place in society. You know, you have the king, you have like the noblemen, um, you know, though maybe independent landowner landowners and then you have like the bourgeois like the townspeople right who are you know somewhat more independent and like serfs but they're you know they have they're still of meager means in comparison um so he calls philistines bourgeois um and possibly he calls them like tradesmen too but i'm not sure in any case i'm not a fan of that that desi that designation the bourgeois is even uh, softer and more obedient than the nobleman. Uh, but pliability and pliability are different. Comparing the second and third wills, uh, Le, uh, Le Rochefoucauld, Foucault? I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, very correctly noted, only people with a strong character can be truly soft, while for others, apparent softness is most often just weakness, which easily turns into embitterment. Indeed, the Philistine is obedient, but not of his own free will, and secretly hating those who violate his will, he is ready to endlessly accumulate grievances at the first opportunity 
cruelly paying for his former obedience. So young Paul McCartney, after parent parental spanking, declaring complete and final repentance, made his way into his parents' bedroom and with the words, here you go, there you are, tore off the muslin on the curtains. Uh, the Russian Tsar Nicholas II was distinguished by his ambiguous uh, complaisance. complaisance. Uh, he once made the following characteristic confession. I always agree with everyone on everything, and then I do it my own way. This was a family trait among the Russian Tsars. Alexander I, the great-grandfather of Nicholas II, was called by his relatives a meek, stubborn man. Uh, so that's, you know, it's kind of like a contradiction, right? To be both meek and stubborn, but you, you could probably imagine someone who's kind of meek but also stubborn, right? Uh, the lower the third will has to bend, the more unexpected and sharp the straightening is. People around us usually characterize such straightening as betrayal, but by and large, the third will never betrays because it never completely belongs to anyone. Loyalty is the lot of either very strong or hopelessly weak people. Uh, the Philistine occupies an intermediate position and therefore is inherently not true, although he usually gives assurances and advances in this regard in abundance. And remember how, you know, the first will and the fourth will are complementary, okay? Uh, they're the productive positions, right? The results-oriented positions. And then the second and third will are complementary. They're the process-oriented. And the first will has no loyalty, you know, but to itself. It's absolutizing. And then the fourth will is, you know, uh, kind of submissive. Um, not in everything, because they have a first function too, but in terms of, like, the spirit, this potentia thing about, you know, dish hashing out how the future is going to go, uh, the fourth will is submissive. And so those types naturally go together, right? The strong man and kind of the loyal followers, right? And then the second will is also kind of disloyal in that, um, you know, it, it's oh, it's fine collaborating, but it's never going to give up its, its, its core essence. It's never going to truly be submissive, right? Um, it wants to collaborate. And the third will, too, you know, might put on the appearance of being submissive, but really they're not because in the same way they don't have that, they have that other's negative um, fear of the other, uh, antipathy towards the other. So, um, yeah, they're also kind of disloyal and he'll get into more, uh, he'll get into the details of that later. But, yeah, so you can kind of see how the third will would conflict with the first will, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> the Philistine occupies an intermediate position and therefore is inherently not true, although he usually gives assurance, inherently not loyal, it means. To be true um, is kind of an older way of saying to be, like, loyal. Um, so he's inherently not true, although he usually gives assurances and advances in this regard um, in abundance. Remembering Andre Belli, uh, Berdiev wrote, In this very bright individuality, the solid core of his personality was lost. A disassociation of personality occurred in his artistic work itself. This, by the way, was expressed in his terrible infidelity in his tendency to betrayal. He came across as a friend of the house. He always agreed with me, since he could not object to my face at all. Then suddenly, he completely disappeared for a while. At this time, he usually published some article with sharp attacks on me. I had the impression that he was settling scores for the fact that, agreeing face-to-face, -face, not being agreed, he acted out in abusive articles. Okay, so he agreed with him face-to-face, -face, but not, not truly, not in his heart. Betrayal, as a form of voluntary response to external irresistible volitional pressure, for the Philistine often coexists as an involuntary response to the same pressure. Gorky, who wrote an article about provocateurs in 1917, received a letter from one such comrade provocateur, which contained the following expressive lines. I'm not making excuses, but I would like the psychology of even such a pitiful creature as a provocateur to be all to, to be understood by you. After all, there are many of us, all the best party workers. This is not an individual ugly phenomenon, but... Obviously, some deeper reason has driven us into this dead end. I ask you, overcome your disgust, come closer to the soul of the traitor, and tell us all, what exactly were the motives that guided us when we, 
believing with all our souls in the party, and socialism in everything holy and pure, and then the translation ends off, but I'm guessing when they did all this stuff, you know, um, what exactly were the motives that guided us uh, when we when we were saboteurs, you know, provocateurs, rather. Uh, the Philistine is a natural double agent because he does not have enough spirit or will to either resist something or belong to something completely. And this is the only main, only and main reason for the paradoxical dual personality that has been observed, is being observed, and will be observed in our already complex, mysterious, metaphorical mental life. Okay, another sippy. Ah. Alright, the cast hierarchical picture of the cosmos, society, family, which lives in... Oh, this is... Okay, this is interesting. Just preparing you for how interesting it is. Um... The cast, a uh, hierarchical picture of the cosmos, society, family, which lives in the soul of the Philistine from birth, is an important element of the psychology of the third will. The main thing in it is the endless complexity of the hierarchy visible through the inner eye. If the reader remembers, the hierarchical, the hierarchical picture of the first will is very simple and is limited to two steps, while the second will simply does not have it. Therefore, one cannot help but recognize the uniqueness of the visible third will hierarchy which, in her opinion, is infinitely complex and consists of an infinite number of components. Again, that's this is kind of interesting because it's like uh, through that through the, the the way that the first will sees the spirit of you know more mundane objects and events, um, the will. Uh, also kind of like splits up the universe and perceives the universe's and the cosmos's spirit in a certain way. So again, for first will, it's like, well, there's, you know, the powerful, the elite, and then there's like everyone else, the followers. There's like the movers, and then there's those who are moved. And then two will has a very nuanced view, but it generally believes in the potential of like everything, right? Because it sees its others positive, and it sees like that there is this potential um, to everything to possibly to grow and become important and influential. Um, so it's a nuanced view. It's not this like dualistic view. Um, and then the third will is also like that, but they they do see hierarchy. They because of that others negative negativity similar to the first will. They do see like up and down, but it's just this very like sprawling hierarchy you can think of yeah i think for the first will the first will is much more like the more you know the autocratic kind of philosophies and ideologies of the modern era right where you have this they're very absolutizing and binary but the third will is kind of more like the medieval mind where it has this like great hierarchy of existence or you could say the kind of like neoplatonic or catholic uh theological mind where you have like well there's god and jesus and there's mary and there's all these saints and then there's humans and different sorts of humans and then each animal so it's like this great like hierarchy of being uh this great chain of being um and as they'll get into that affects the political form that uh third will takes um where it's more of like this kind of like sprawling bureaucracy with many like titles um, and a lot of like middling complexity, whereas the first will polity is like the absolute ruler and everyone else, you know, and there's sort of this like weird egalitarian um, uh, nature with the first will, be just because they're like, you know, they're not going to recognize the titular authorities of, you know, all these people below them. It's just, you know, there's the powerful and there's the ruler and the ruled. Okay. Okay. So, it is possible, impossible to, to describe everything that, in the opinion of a Philistine, matters when determining a place in life. A place in the cosmic ladder, a place in the ladder of nature, age, gender, race, nationality, religion, origin, position, appearance, property, status, profession, education, and many other seemingly invisible components that allow the Philistine to find everyone a special place in his cast picture of the world. In itself, the recognition of the existence of differences among the creatures inhabiting the world would not have carried anything alarming in, its, in itself if the third will had not absolutized all these differences and having absolutized it had not built its relationships and behavior accordingly. 
Um, so absolutizing this very complex hierarchical vision of the world. How this looks in practice is easy, easy to observe in our literary world and in the figures of such giants as Pushkin and uh, Bryusov. Here are two sketches from life. The feeling of equality was completely alien to Bryusov. Perhaps, however, this was also influenced by the bourgeois environment from which Bryusov came. The bourgeoisie bends its back much more easily than, for example, an aristocrat or a worker. To humiliate another overwhelms a happy tradesman more than a worker um, or an aristocrat. Uh, so humiliating people is kind of like what tradesmen or bourgeois middle class people do. Um, every cricket knows its nest. Respect the rank of rank. These ideas were introduced into literary relations by Bryusov straight from uh, Svetnoy Boulevard. Bryusov knew how to either command or obey. To show independence meant once and for all to acquire an enemy in the person of Bryusov. Uh, Pushkin considered his treatment not with a person's personality, but with his position in the world, and that is why he recognized the most insignificant Barak as his brother, and was offended when they met him in society as a writer, not as an aristocrat. So in other words, as they, as they, uh, they acted toward him and treated him as a writer and not as like a fellow aristocrat, um, even though he um, wasn't. I don't, I don't know actually if he was an aristocrat technically, but I don't think he was. But he kind of styled himself as one. Uh, and he actually gives like a pretty good um, rationale for why he calls him bourgeois there. So I don't know. I'll walk back my my earlier um, <clears throat> my earlier treatment. So uh, the casteism of the Philistine is especially noticeable against the background of the equal attitude of the nobleman told towards others. Um, so it's comparing two v and three v is um, indicative. Uh, Another contemporary of Pushkin continued, Delvig and all his comrades at the Lyceum, uh, might be actually Lycium, um, but let's say Lyceum for now, were the same in his treatment, but Pushkin treated him differently, treated them differently. He was quite friendly with Delvig and obeyed when Delvig restrained him from excessive card playing and from visiting the nobility too often, to which Pushkin was very inclined. He treated some of his fellow Lyceum students, in whom Pushkin did not see anything remarkable, including M.L. Yakovlev, somewhat arrogantly, for which he often received punishment from Delvig. Okay, so maybe Delvig was a 2V type, and he was kind of trying to, like, guide Pushkin and, like, rein him in. Um, like any phenomenon, casteism of the third will also has its positive side. It makes the Philistine a highly tactful being, sensitive to invisible class barriers over which other wills often stumble due to their blindness. And with the one who has 500 of them, again, it is not the same as with the one who has 800 of them. In a word, even if it goes up to a million, there will be shades of everything. Suppose, for example, there is an office, not here, but in a distant country, and in the office, let us, let us suppose, there is a ruler of the office. I ask you to look at him where he sits among his subordinates, but you simply cannot utter a word out of fear. Uh, pride, I'm not sure where that's going. Uh, pride and nobility, and what doesn't his... Uh, but you simply cannot utter a word out of fear, pride and nobility. And what does, doesn't his face express? Just take a brush and paint. Prometheus, determined Prometheus, looks out like an eagle, acts smoothly, measuredly. The same eagle, as soon as he left the room and approaches the office of his boss, is in such a hurry as a partridge with paper under his arms that there is no urine. Okay, this is just getting very garbled here. Uh, in society and on a party, even if everyone is of low rank, Prometheus will still remain Prometheus, and a little higher than him. Such a transformation will take place with Prometheus, which even Ovid would not invent. A fly smaller than even a fly, destroyed into a grain of sand. Uh, yes, this is not Ivan Petrovich, you say, looking at him. Ivan Petrovich is taller, and this one is short and thin. He speaks loudly, has a deep bass voice, and never laughs, but this one, the devil knows what. He squeaks like a bird and keeps laughing. You come closer and you look like Ivan Petrovich. So that whole paragraph is just so garbled. I really don't even know what's going on there. Um, uh, reading Gogol, uh, or Gogol, we will not rush to the conclusion that the casteism of the third will concerns only public life. Uh, for the Philistine, the hierarchical principle is universal. Philistine philosophers 
create systems of platonic complex subordination of worlds. Uh, Philistine theologians rank spiritual forces, saints and religions, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Philistine ethnographers, in a fascist manner, assign different ranks to races and peoples. As for the Philistine everyman, he, being in a person or an absentia, agrees with everything that postulates, casts in various spheres of life, strives first of all, according to one clear but firm sign, to establish a strict system of subordination in his own family. Uh, which is interesting because, you know, there's some similarity between the first and the third, just as there's similarity between the second and fourth, okay? Um, so you can see that there's, like, this hierarchism that's, like, the first function, but it's also different, um, and I think that's been well explained. From the outside, the system of Philistine uh, family veneration sometimes looks funny, sometimes frightening. For example, uh, Vasily Rozanov did not allow his household to eat meat from the soup and ate it in splendid isolation. So he ate all this, the meat in the soup and made his family, you know, just eat the rest of it. Okay. Uh, and Dostoevsky's father, going to bed during the day, forced his overage sons to drive flies away from his face. However, be that as it may, the hierarchy for the Philistine is almost the only firmament on which he can rely with more or less confidence, which is usually unusually significant in the conditions of the psyche of the third will, subject to all the winds, constantly and ins constantly and swayed by everyone. However, the Philistine would not be himself if, in relation to the hierarchy, he did not simultaneously act as both a guardian and a shaker of it. The niche, the niche that the third will occupies in the hierarchy, it deserves, it deserves, eh. <laughs> The niche that the third will occupies in the hierarchy it discerns is a cage, with all the ensuing circumstances of convenience and inconvenience. She is a shell and a prison, a shield and a vice. The table of ranks does not allow the Philistine to fall below his assigned place, but it does not allow him to rise above it. Therefore, the third will is both the guardian and the shaker of, of the bureaucracy. The difference is that the lower fate places the Philistine, the more he is a waver, uh, the higher is, the more he, the more a keeper. And maybe it means a uh, waverer, I'm not sure, or a rebel, I'm not sure. This circumstance, by the way, can explain the evolution of many political figures who began their careers as extreme radicals and ended as extreme conservatives. However, by and large, uh, every Philistine in his deeds is more of an organizer of hierarchy, while in his dreams he is more of a destroyer. The fact is that he is prevented from turning destructive dreams into action by chronic self-doubt. The fear that the free soaring unbound uh, by the shackles of ranks will not only, uh, will, will, only, will not only not lift him up, but on the contrary will drop him to the bottom of public life. Therefore, even after thinking at his leisure, he decides that it is safer not to take risks and leave everything as it is. Uh, take a sip. The third will loves and hates power, and he loves more than he hates. In the subconscious of the Philistine, power is mystically identified with will. And since his own will is wounded, the Philistine experiences for the bearer of power a feeling similar to what an old tuberculosis patient experiences for, experiences for a young, plump, rosy-cheeked peasant woman. Okay, what a, uh, what a analogy there. Um, the third will envies, hates, and at the same time unconsciously and almost disinterestedly clings to power, strives to stay longer in its field. Uh, Pushkin, the author of very radical poems, according to his best friend, had some kind of pathetic uh, habit of betraying his noble character, and very often angered me and all of us in general by the fact that he loved, for example, hanging around the orchestra, around Orlov, uh, Chernyshev, Kisilev, and others, they listened to his jokes and witticisms with a patronizing smile. It happened from their chairs to make a sign to him, he would immediately come running. Yeah, so it's kind of, basically his friends were like, just thinking, you know, he's kind of, he does have a noble character, but he kind of betrays it because he acts very, like, sycophantically to these aristocrats um, due to his, like, insecurity. Um, uh, through the unconscious and almost selfless love of the third will for power, one long-standing and seemingly insoluble historical paradox is easily explained. No matter how cruel the tyrant was, no matter how methodically 
he mowed down the heads of those around him, the place around him was never empty. Uh, surprisingly, there were always kamikazes eager to fill the gaps in the tyrants' constantly thinned out retinue with their bodies, for the sake of a brief moment in the halls of power. This craving is akin to uh, somnambulism, akin to the force that irresistibly attracts a butterfly to the fire. Uh, power as a visible expression of will is the only thing that the third will truly loves, and for which it is ready to make any sacrifice. At the same time, the Philistine, with all his love for power, is prone to engaging in hidden sabotage, secret opposition, foolishness, demonstration of false humility, and external indifference to power. And such an ambivalent attitude towards power often shocks others. As one of the poet's contemporaries wrote, Pushkin was some kind of mysterious two-faced creature. He was both a conservative and a revolutionary. The third will is wonderful in the role of a subordinate. In general, it is more convenient for her to be a follower when making decisions rather than a leader and take less responsibility. Uh, Walter Schellenberg, chief of the Nazi SD, described his uh, first impressions of the spectacle of the organization that later became his home. The silent interaction of all the gears of an invisible mechanism, as it seemed to me, was opening up new doors for me, commanding me as if I were a weak-willed doll. But the main advantage of the third will as a servant is not complaisance. Um, uh, the advantage is that she is not stupidly and directly executive, but artistically executive. Being searching and helpful, the Philistine serves not out of fear, but out of conscience. Like a sunflower, being fo like a sunflower following the sun, he follows his superiors with his inner eye, striving to fulfill even his unspoken wishes. So there, for example, is a you know, positive side, like all the positions have a negative and positive side. Even the third is that they, they do make good followers. They make good, um, you know, supporters because they, they're so sensitive to the nuances and they're so focused on it. This, you know, it's such a, a pain point and ulcer for them that they devote extra attention to it. They can be very good supporters. Uh, as good as the third will is as a subordinate, it is so terrible as a boss. The first thing that makes the activity of a Philistine as a boss unfruitful is the inconsistency, half-heartedness, and ambiguity of his, of his decisions, due, of course, to his character, or better said, weak character. In my opinion, Speransky gave the best characterization of the third will as a chief. Speaking about Alexander I, you know the suspicious character of the sovereign. Everything he does, he does half-heartedly. He is too weak to rule and too strong to be manageable. The second thing that spoils matters even more in this situation is the attitude of the third will towards subordinates. One can say that about almost every Philistine what was said at one time about the emperor Caligula. There, was, there were no better slave and no worse sovereign in the world. The trouble partly lies in the same identification of power and will, characteristic of his mental picture. After becoming the boss, the third will decides that the place should paint her and begins to imit imitate the style and behavior of the first will i.e. excess of will. But since the position of a boss does not change anything in the order of functions of the Philistine, what he ends up with is not a copy, a caricature of, of the Tsar. Uh, he ends up with swagger instead of pride, stubbornness instead of perseverance, tyranny instead of dictatorship. Yes, yes, tyrants are born and are certainly born with the third will. Other wills either value power little or feel strong enough to not, to not abuse it too much. The Philistine is a different matter. Having received power into his hands, the object of his timid secret desires, he realizes in the depths of his soul how little he is worthy of such a gift, and the fear of discovering his dis this discrepancy hurries him to crush around him everything independent, everything personal, and on occasion, everything living. At the same time, perhaps the main victim of the tyranny of the Philistine tyrant in the end turns out to be himself, a victim primarily a psychological one third will, like no one else, is sensitive to the attitude towards itself and is extremely painful discovering coldness, alienation, and fear in place of the former war warmth and goodwill. So in other words, you know, finding out that once in power and once becoming a tyrant, everyone around them is cold and fearful and paranoid, and that makes them paranoid and fearful, and they kind of miss the former, uh, good, you know, warmth and goodwill. Uh, but here the Philistine cannot help himself. The, adic the adequacy of the reaction, 
the naturalness and evenness of relationships are most difficult for him, especially in the position of authority, and the Philistine with his own hands continues to deepen the abyss that he himself hates, separating him from his subordinates. Here is an excerpt uh, from one letter to a psychiatrist. Everything seems to be fine. Healthy, athletic, good family, cheerful, many friends, hobbies. I like the work. The team is nice, although of course not without... Dot, dot, dot. That's the problem. Can I handle it? Uh, the first steps are alarming, although I know the business like the back of my mind. I have been awarded many times, etc. I make mistake after mistake. There is no certainty. Either I disgustingly ingratiate myself, then I fall into stony categoricalness, dry formalism. I begin to lose mutual understanding with people, trust, spontane spontaneity, warmth, and this is the most precious thing for me, and for this they value me. I'm afraid that appreciated will soon have to be used in the past tense. This is the cry of the soul of the Philistine who has become the boss. So it's the guy who's very, he's insecure about his position as boss and overly worried about the way he's coming across um, and about the trust and appreciation of others. Um, uh, take a sip real quick. There's one more sure sign that makes it easy to distinguish the king from the Philistine imitating him. So in other words, the 1V from the 3V. The fact is that although that the fact is that, as I already mentioned, the first will holds all its functions with an iron hand, allowing them to be realized only in royally elevated forms, and does not entrust them to anyone. So in other words, the first will kind of has this effect on the other the other uh, aspects in the other positions and kind of like makes them more royal. It kind of elevates them um, and makes it so that the ones that are others positive, the second and fourth, are somewhat less superficially others positive than for other types with a different position of will, if that makes sense. Uh, the same cannot be said about the third will, which is completely incapable of control over other functions. The second emotion chronically drove Emperor Nero to the stage. The second physics forced Peter the Great to stand for hours at a lathe, and neither one nor the other could do anything with their passions for the second, although they probably guessed that they did not add authority to them. The ears of the first function also emerge uncontrollably in the behavior of the Philistine. Not sure what that means, the ears. Um, no matter what lordly air Khrushchev sometimes put on himself, the excessive first emotion was the pearl of all the cracks of his nature. Uh, meaning that the excessive first emotion was kind of the most, the most obvious of all, the most ostensible of all his of all his failings. Um, the example of Khrushchev clearly shows that the third will has no power over the fourth function either. Khrushchev's fourth logic was constantly captured by various, often delusional ideas, clearly brought in from outside, which he easily accepted for execution. Which, of course, also did little to color his image of royalty. Hmm. So, uh, Fauci? <laughs> no, I think it's like Fauch, maybe? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, but that guy despises people so much because he knows himself too well. Uh, Talleyrand uh, noted self-critically. Uh, Talleyrand noted self-critically, judging by himself. Uh, the Philistine is afraid, does not love, and does not respect himself. But in his own image and likeness, he is afraid, does not love, and does not respect others. Right. You know, self-negative, others-negative. Although sometimes the feeling of gigantic potential in oneself sometimes gives the Philistine moments of extreme narcissism and extreme conceit. Uh, Sophia Tolstaya wrote in her diary, I think I'm pregnant, and I'm not happy. Everything is scary. I look at everything with hostility. The desire for some kind of power to be above everyone. It's hard for me to understand, but it's true. Self-esteem of the third will is a pendulum constantly oscillating from pole to pole. As Honor uh, Balzac's mother used to say, Honor considered himself either everything or nothing. And this is the holy truth. The split will, the support of the personality, drives the Philistine from one extreme of self-esteem to another, almost never keeping him at an adequate level. And together with the will, the entire order of functions of the third will changes constant vacillation in thoughts, feelings, behavior, assessments is a normal state for it.
The third will is restless, uncooperative, and eternally dissatisfied. Put her, in her, put her in heaven, she won't get along there either, because the hell in which the Philistine chronically lives is located in himself. Uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob Bohm uh, said that an angel uh, standing in the middle of hell feels like he is in heaven, while a devil who goes to heaven feels like he is in hell, and he was right. Our habitat is only a reflection of our eye. Therefore, it is natural that the sick, broken spirit of the third will does not see the world as anything other than uncomfortable, unfair, hopelessly vicious. A Philistine is a very difficult person in the community. Anger at the whole world, suspiciousness, touchiness, unpredictability, capriciousness, servility, replaced by rudeness, do not brighten the life of the third will itself and turn the life of those around them into chronic torture. Uh, I don't know. That's not true. Uh, Gogol's friend, historian uh, Pagodin, when the writer moved out of his apartment, crossed himself and bowed after the, the departing carriage. Uh, Dickens repeatedly repeated approximately the same gesture when, after a month of staying as a guest, Anderson left his home. Uh, the third will is very careful in relations with people, and no matter how the circumstances develop, never makes sudden movements either towards or away from a person. The evolution of the Philistine's attitude towards others is best imagined as a funeral, as a funnel. He slowly, in a spiral, allows a person to approach him and just as slowly pushes him away. The evolution of Nero's attitudes towards Seneca or Stalin's towards Bukharin are clear examples of this. From the caution of the third will, it does not at all follow that it is normative in relationships and its behavior is always adequate to the situation, vice versa. The constantly fluctuating mental body of the Philistine never reacts adequately to the situation. One gifted emigrant poet re repented, Again, I was rude to some, bowed before others. I always either in the face or in the legs. Um, not sure what that last part of that means. Uh, secrecy and espionage are another seemingly contradictory, but in fact consistent character trait of the third will. She is a conspirator and a spy rolled into one. The Philistine's tendency toward the underground is not difficult to explain. Feeling like a naked mollusk, he simply cannot allow himself to be sincere, accessible, and open. However, the third will would not be itself if, being secretive, it were not burdened by its secrecy and did not long, did not long for confession. One gets the impression that the institution of confession in the church was created specifically for the Philistines, allowing, allowing them to be sincere without fear of censure and retribution. Sometimes, even without the church, the third will plucks up the courage to show his underwear, which surprises those around him in the least. Uh, one contemporary wrote about Dumas the father, he is at the same time sincere and secretive. It happens that the Philistine gets naked under the influence of wine fumes, and I don't know a more terrible spectacle than this. Um, so when drunk. A disgraceful behavior when drunk is the strongest sign of the third will. I think everyone has had the opportunity to observe such a person when your dearest most kind acquaintance, having taken a drink of the bottle, suddenly turns into a brutal bore, the blackness of whose soul and mind Satan himself will envy, from whose lips I begin to hear such confessions and such philippics that you can take away the saints. The bourgeois usually knows that he is not good at hops, and, is, uh, and it is reasonable to do so when he goes into lifelong cessation solely for this reason. Uh, from the total vulnerability of the third will, along with secrecy, its tendency to spy directly stems. The Philistine is afraid of people, and therefore is curious about them. The chronic fear of running into, into a blow forces him to watch those around him, collect and hoard stones in his bosom, with the help of which he could fight back in the event of, a, of, in the event of an attack. Out of fear, the third will is tireless in its, in its analysis of a person, his relationships and reactions, so we can say that if there is a natural gift for a psychologist, then this gift is given only to the Philistine. Hmm. Um, do, do, do. Uh, true, the psychologism of the third will is somewhat one-sided. She's interested not so much in the person as a whole, but in the funny, dirty, ugly, scary sides of his nature and existence. The Philistine is a consistent collector of compromising evidence, and the circumstance rewards him with another natural gift, the gift of a satirist, not to be confused with the talent of a humorist. And almost all great satirists had a third will. You have to really dislike and disrespect yourself and those around you 
in order to devote your life to ridic ridiculing human shortcomings and weaknesses and do it as talently as Swift, Moliere, and Gogol did. Um, right, and so you can contrast that with the the two, the second volition's kind of lack of curiosity and their indifference to people's dirty laundry and their kind of like natural like uninterestedness in it with the, th the third whale who's very interested in it. Uh, <clears throat> Despite the fact that the Philistine himself is a great lover and master of ridicule, there is no person who would be afraid, who would be so afraid of laughter. Sometimes it comes down to a joke. Here's one of them. In the 40s, uh, I.S. Turgenev um, once had a company in St. Petersburg. Uh, Belinsky, Herzen, Ogarev, and someone else, someone else were there. They played cards while Dostoevsky was entering the hall. Someone became very heavy, and therefore there was general laughter. Dostoevsky turned pale, stopped, then turned, and without saying a word, left the room. At first, they did not pay attention to this, but since he did not return, then I.S., as the owner, went to find out where he had gone. Where is Fyodor? Mikhailovich? Um, he asked the footman. They've been walking around the yard for a whole hour now and without a hat. It happened in, in winter in bitter frost. I.S. ran into the yard. What's wrong with you, Dostoevsky? Uh, for mercy, this is unbearable. Whenever I appear, everyone laughs at me. No sooner had I appeared on your uh, had I appeared on your doorstep than you and your guests made me laugh, meaning they made um, they laughed at him. Aren't you ashamed? So, but you know, I'm sure you get that story. But basically, they weren't laughing at him, but he just assumed due to, due to his insecurity that they were. Uh, of course, Turgenev somewhat caricatured the embarrassment with Dostoevsky, but fundamentally, the story is true as can be seen from the way Dostoevsky later paid off uh, Turgenev by drawing his character, caricature portrait in The Possessed. But this is by the way. Uh, the reliability of Turgenev's story is also given by the repetition of such stories. For example, contemporaries of Alexander I reported, one day Kisilev, Orlov, uh, and Kotuzov, standing at the window in the courtyard, told each other jokes and laughed. Alexander passed by. Ten minutes later, Kislev was called into his office. The general found Alexander in front of a in front of the mirror. The emperor carefully he examined himself from all sides. He decided that they were laughing at him at his appearance. What's funny about me? Why did you and Kutazov and Orlov laugh at me? The suspicious emperor interrogated. The richest material for analyzing the motives of behavior and reactions of the third will is provided by the figure of Stalin the most terrible person in world history. The essence of his psychological flaw was perfectly outlined by Nikolai uh, Bukharin, a comrade in arms and a victim of the tyrant, when he said that Stalin was unhappy because he could not convince everyone, even himself, that he was superior to everyone. And for this very misfortune, he could not help but take revenge on people. Indeed, the thirst for revenge on society for the feeling of one's own inferiority was the main incentive for Stalin's actions, from choosing a career as a revolutionary to the later bloody purges. However, there was one more nuance not noticed by Bukharin, which greatly aggravated the condition of Stalin's already sick soul, physical defects. The fact is that if a Philistine like Stalin has, physis has um, uh, first physics at the top, and this circumstance is accompanied by a significant physical disability, then the vulnerability of his spirit increases many times over. One of Byron's, Byron's acquaintances re relayed his following words. If this, he raised his finger to his forehead, raises me above people, then this, pointing to his leg, which I guess was like injured or malformed or something, puts me lower than all others. Indeed, Byron's lameness, Beethoven's deafness, Dostoevsky's epilepsy, turned the life of these mentally not very healthy, but essentially cheerful people into a chronic nightmare. Okay, so by the way, I think he meant that if they have uh, first or second physics, because Dostoevsky, I know, he types as an EFBL. Uh, the same story with Stalin, fused toes, traces of smallpox in the face, and the withered hands that developed over time to cosmic proportions exaggerated the Stalinist inferiority complex. Um, from the combination of the third will with physical defects, the, the Stalin phenomenon mainly grew, 
where everything acquired monstrous proportions, hypocrisy, unprincipledness, deceit, cruelty. One of Stalin's secretaries wrote, Gradually myths and legends were created about him, for example, about his extraordinary will, firmness, and determination. This is a myth. Stalin is an extremely cautious and indecisive person. He very often does not know how to be and what to do. I've seen many times how he hesitates uh, and would rather prefer to follow events than to lead them. Uh, this statement would seem to contradict numerous memoirs that speak of Stalin's unusual spirited strength, which raised him almost to the point of demonism. Here's one of them. Stalin had some kind of hypnotic power, menacing, demonic power. The very place of the interviews, as I perceived it, resembled a field of night demonic forces. It was enough for Stalin to appear in the room, and everyone around him seemed to stop breathing and freeze. Uh, with him came anger, an atmosphere of fear arose. But, strange as it may seem, there is no contradiction between the two evidence given. Each person does not inspire anything into society. Each person simply brings into it what he carries with him, with, yeah, within himself. The czar infects society with energy and ambition. The nobleman with peace and good nature. The Philistine with anxiety and uncertainty. Therefore, the atmosphere of fear that arose in society when Stalin appeared was determined not by... Uh, some of his demonic powers, but by the fear that the tyrant felt for those around him and which he invisibly infected. Each person has his own aura, his own field. The specificity of the Philistine aura is that it is, it is completely saturated with nervousness, anxiety, and self-doubt, and a person, having found himself in its, in its field, is quite capable of being infected with the same moods for the duration of contact. How, however, um, and I think it cuts off. <clears throat> it cuts off right there. Um, also, I want to say that often when he kind of does this uh, listing out and comparing of the functions and positions, he often leaves off the fourth position, um, which is unfortunate. I would say to complete this um, listing here, the fourth position kind of infects other, like the the serf, as he calls it, the the fourth volition kind of infects others with the sort of like it's a de-energizing um not in a uh in a bad way de-energizing but just sort of like a stabilizing um calming um like the nobleman the set the two v infects others with like kind of a peace and a feeling of possibilities right with um some excitement Okay, uh, or that the future can change and that we can take advantage of it together, right? So it's kind of elect electrifying, okay? Um, the fourth volition infects others with sort of this like calmness, with putting down ambitions, laying them aside, and just being happy with the current situation, okay? One moment. If the reader remembers, the desire for collegiality, um, collegiality when making decisions is one of the surest signs, is one of the signs, oh, excuse me, when making decisions is one of the signs of the processional nature of the will. Uh, so 2V and 3V. The Philistine has a processional will, which is why he is a supporter of uh, collegiality but he interprets it in a per rather peculiar way. There are two options. If the third will is subordinate, then it seeks to influence the decision, but does not take any responsibility for it. If the third will is the boss, she prefers to make decisions alone, but either does not bear responsibility for them at all, or shares it with other people who are not involved in decision-making. Here's a typical example. Uh, when in 1942, Stalin decided to cheer up the fallen morale of the troops, he turned to the names and traditions and attributes of the Tsarist army. Among other things, Stalin decided to introduce shoulder straps and gave corresponding instructions to Army General Krulev. The general later recalled, As time passed and the issue was not resolved, at the beginning of January 1943, I persistently asked not to postpone the issue of introducing shoulder straps any further. Stalin asked me repro reproachfully, why do, why do you bother with these shoulder straps and uniforms? 
I had no choice but to say that everything was being done according to his instructions, and the decision, whatever it was, was important to us. Uh, Stalin ordered to show him all ordered to show him all the prepared samples. Having received his consent, I called the chief quartermaster, Colonel General Drak Drachev, um, Drakhev maybe, who 15 minutes later was already in Stalin's reception room with all the samples of shoulder straps and a changed uniform. Stalin ordered to connect him with M.I. Kalinin. Uh, Kalinin immediately called and Stalin asked him to come in. After 10 to 15 minutes, Kalinin entered. Here is comrade Kalinin, he said. Krulev is offering us to restore the old regime. You can imagine Krulev's face at that moment. Uh, Kalinin, <laughs> um, so, okay, this is Stalin. Stalin's like, okay, yeah, here's comrade Kalinin. Uh, um, he said, Krulev is offering us to restore the old Tsarish regime. So he's kind of like accused, you know, because remember, Stalin was the one who came up with, with this idea, but now he's pretending that he didn't. And he's accusing these other guys of not only coming up with the idea, but they want to, like, they're essentially, they're, they're secret reactionaries, that they're trying to bring back the old costumery of the Tsarist regime. Um, so he's, like, toying with them. Now, Krulev is offering us to restore the old regime. Uh, Kalinin, taking his time, looked at the all the samples and said, You see, you and I remember the old regime, but the youth do not remember it. And if this form is liked by the young and can be useful in the war against fascism, then this form should be accepted. Stalin quick, quickly reacted, exclaiming, And you, comrade Kalinin, are you for the old regime? This time, the time it has come for Kalinin's face to stretch out, um, meaning for him to have a, you know, a grimace, right, of fear. Kalinin reiterated that he was not for the old regime, but for the benefits the uniform could bring in the fight against the enemy. Probably our persistence and support of M.I. Kalinin had an effect this time, and the decision to introduce uh, shoulder straps were, was made. So yeah, that's just like the, you know, psychoticness of Stalin, you know, coming up with this, this decision and then deciding to like embarrass and, um, you know, toy with the, uh, the generals, right? I hope the reader notice with what virtuosity Stalin shifted responsibility for the delicate decision he single-handedly made to Krulev and Kalinin. This behavior is typical of the third will. Irresponsibility is generally a distinctive character trait of the third will. It is more difficult for her than anyone to take responsibility, keep her word, be punctual, etc. And this is understandable. The Philistine is too busy with himself, with his sores and wounds, with his fears of a world supposedly hostile to him, to seriously think about others and be responsible for himself. A Philistine is a child to the grave, dependent, irresponsible, selfish, capricious, crafty. My father is a big child, whom I acquired when I was still very small. Dumas, the son, joked bitterly. Um, at the same time, some clarification should be made to the question of the age of the Philistine. It is better to call the owner of the fourth will a child in the true sense of the word. More on that later while the top two wills are completely adult people. The third will is an intermediate state between adulthood and childhood. The Philistine is a teenager, and only in the context of this special age in a person's life does the specifics of the psychology of the third will become clear. Uh, Kodasevich, remembering Gumilyov, wrote, He was surprisingly young in soul, and perhaps in mind. He always seemed like a child to me. There was something childish in his buzz-cut head, in his bearing more like a gymnasium than a military one. Uh, the, child, the childishness burst through in his fascination with Africa, the war, and finally, in the feigned importance that surprised me so much at the first meeting, in which suddenly slid down, disappeared somewhere, until he caught himself and pulled it back on himself. He liked to pretend to be an adult. Like all children, he loved to play master, the literary boss of his... Gumminets, I don't know what that means. That is the little poets and oh, <laughs> the little poets and poetesses who surrounded him. Uh, the poetic children loved him very much. Sometimes after lectures on poetics, he played a uh, blind man's blind man's buff with her, in the most literal and not figurative sense of the word. Um, I saw this twice, 
Gumilyov then looked like a nice uh, fifth grader who was playing around with his preparations. It was funny to see. So yeah, I, I sort of get that, that story. And I hope you do, because I'm not re-explaining it. Uh, if a Philistine has a, has a physicist at the top, um, meaning if the Philistine is like 1F or 2F, um, then he is usually an unfaithful lover and spouse. And the mighty power of high-ranking physics is not to blame. When the number of sexual contacts exceeds several dozen, it becomes clear that it is not the peculiarities of physiology, not rich in options, that, drove, that, dr that drive the Don Juan from one partner to another. The source of the Philistines' tendency to red tape, I guess meaning adultery, is an attempt strong, uh, through strong physics to personally assert himself to convince himself and others of the significance of his eye due to the quantity and quality of love relationships. By quality, we should not understand the beauty, youth, or wealth of a partner, although they also play their role. Quality for the third will is, first of all, the social status of a partner or some form of grace to which he is involved. For example, Pushkin seduced an old Greek woman because, according to legend, Byron kissed her and added her to his Don Juan list. John Kennedy tried to do the same with 60-year-old Marlene Dietrich. Uh, Vasily Rosnov married Dostoevsky's much older former mistress. And Yasenin could boast of a whole fan of socially significant and grace-marked women. Uh, Chaliapin's daughter, Isidora Duncan, Tolstoy's granddaughter. Although it cannot be said that the Don Juanism of the Philistine brings him only dividends. The same Yesenin, having arrived in America with Isidore Duncan, and finding his photograph on the front pages of American newspapers, was furious when it turned out that the newspapers were not announcing the arrival of the great Russian poet, but about the arrival of Duncan's husband. The marriage with Tolstoy also did not bring joy to Yesenin, although amused his ambition beyond measure. I will say just one of the uh, piquant and sad episodes of this novel. Even during the matchmaking period, Yesenin and Tolstoy came to visit someone. Yesenin quickly got drunk and calling his acquaintance into the next room with a frightened and tense face said, I lifted her hem and her legs are hairy. I am an honest person. Uh, since I gave my word, I will keep it, but understand you can't do this. At least shave your hair. And then, as if having forgotten about everything that he had just said, he moved on to something else, how to celebrate the wedding, which of the guests to invite, and repeated several times with a laugh that everything would work out great. Uh, Ser Sergei Yesenin and Tolstaya, the, gra the granddaughter of Leo Tolstoy. In parallel with his affair with Tolstaya, Yesenin had an affair with uh, uh, Chalyapin's uh, daughter and, once, and, and often said, which is better, Yesenin and Chalyapin or Yesenin and Tolstaya? Ambition, in general, terribly muddies the purity of sexual sensations experienced by the third will. Climbing under the blanket, she not so much pleases the flesh as she dominates and often um, as she dominates and often dominates not over the one she holds in her arms, but over the one whom this object presents. Um, so she dominates both the person that they are making love to. And they're also dominating the person to whom the person they're lovemaking to technically belong. So, you know, they're they're dominating the person who their bed partner is betraying. Okay. The theme of the love and uh, marital passions of the Philistine is boundless. Therefore, I will know only one more feature of his psychology: uh, a tendency towards misalliance. Neither in love nor in marriage does the, third, does the third will seek an equal. She, either like Balzac, gives preference to those who are older, richer, more noble, or vice versa, to those who are younger, poorer, more plebeian, Nabokov's nymphets. And the mechanism of such multidirectional preferences is quite transparent. In the soul of the Philistine, infantilism and despotism easily and naturally coexist. Therefore, no matter in which direction the misalliance is directed, it always meets one or another need of the third will. The main thing is that it is a misalliance. The third will fundamentally does not admit its mistakes and guilt. Although in 90 cases out of 100, it is she who is to blame and the one who makes the mistake. Uh, don't know if that's fair. 
At the same time, it does not follow from what has been said that deep down in his soul, the Philistine is not aware of the true state of affairs. Vice versa. He is aware and very well, very he is very aware, uh, but admitting his mistakes and guilt is, is impossible to him. Since for the consciousness of a Philistine, it is tantamount to admitting his insignificance, although it is precisely uh, this kind of denial that betrays his weakness. One of the women close to Gumilyov wrote, Gumilyov, uh, he was quite stubborn, which also rather indicates, indicates a weak will. No matter how many stubborn people I met there, they were all weak-willed. Gumilyov admitted, I know that I'm wrong, but it is difficult for me to admit this to someone else. I can't, nor can I ask for forgiveness. Returning to the topic of combining the third will with high-ranking physics, I would like to note that denial in this case is combined with attempts to make amends through material means gifts. Yep, and I, I that I, was kind of something I mentioned with uh, first physics, um, that first physics, but also second physics, just that, you know, their early recourse is to just, you know, is material recompense, you know, to make because that's what they understand. They understand material reality. Um, uh, for example, one of Gogol's acquaintances while in Rome somehow had a strong argument with him, and then this is what happened. After a few thoughtful steps, Gogol ran up to the first lemonade stand located on the street, of which there are many in Rome, and chose two oranges, and returning to us, handed one of them to me with a serious expression. This orange touched me. It became, so to speak, a formula through which Gogol expressed the inner need for some kind of concession and reconciliation. Another example, Byron one day, throwing a stone at a sparrow, he hurt a little girl. She began to cry. They tried to force him to ask for forgiveness. He closed himself off in stubborn anger. Do you know that I am Byron's son, he told, he told her. Um, an hour later, he brought his victim some sweets. Okay, that, that confused me because... He mentioned Byron, but then he's like, do you know that I am Byron's son? Um, but then the point of the story is that he was kind of stubborn and he used his social status um, as a reaction. But then later he like brought his victim sweets out of, you know, as for recompense. Okay, recompense. I can confirm the system in the behavior of Gogol and Byron from personal experience. One of my friends whose third will was combined with the first physics was once again rude to her roommate, and immediately after the quarrel, she ran to buy a shirt at a nearby store. She never apologized, but over time, her roommate accumulated an impressive stack of shirts. Everything is double in the soul of the Philistine. His attitude towards fame is also divided. On the, on the one hand, he, acting like a fool, likes to repeat after Pushkin that glory is just a bright patch on miserable rags, and on the other hand, no one experiences a more feverish thirst for glory than the third will. And remember, the first will is actually not very glory hungry. Um, they're power hungry, but they don't really care about glory because they're secure. They're like, okay, what is this glory doing for me? Um, you know, they, they don't care. Uh, and when the opportunity arises to become famous, she drinks the cup of glory without belching or experiencing society, uh, satiety. Um, however, here's a paradox. No matter how popular and loud the praise, the Philistine always listens to it, not without secret bitterness, and for him the wine of glory is always a little poisoned. Firstly, it always seems that there is not enough of it, and the sound of hallelujah could be boosted a little more. Secondly, deep down in his soul, the Philistine himself does not believe that he is worthy of such recognition, and this is also and this also adds a significant fly in the ointment to the triumphant oint to the Okay. It also adds a significant fly in the ointment to the triumph. Uh, finally, in the most powerful, in a constant and numerous chorus of those who praise, there is always one true or imaginary ill-wisher. So they suspect that even though there's all these people praising them, that at least one person is, and is actually a, an ill-wisher. Um, that's enough. With his only sour expression, he will immediately poison the Philistine the whole holiday. Uh, as Akhmatova very accurately said about Stalin, that he listened to Hooray all day long, and that he is a luminary and a ger generalissimo, and how they love him. And in the evening, some Frenchman on the radio says about him, this mustache, and and it, and it his... So the Frenchman on the radio starts insulting Stalin's, especially his appearance, 
And all you know, once again, Stalin is thrown into a tizzy, um, even though all day he had been he had been listening to praise. Uh, third will loves titles, uh, diplomas, awards. It seems to her that they are the shell that will protect her weak, sick mental body, that they are the certificates that will certify the usefulness of her being, which is felt from the inside as inferior. Brezhnev. However, even here we cannot do without foolishness. The Roman historian wrote about Tiberius, who had just ascended the throne, although he decided without hesitation to immediately accept and apply the supreme power, although he had already uh, surrounded himself with armed guards, a guarantee and a sign of dominance, yet in words he refused power for a long time, playing out the most shameless comedy. Of course, the Romans would be in great trouble if they refused to participate in this comedy and gave the title of emperor to someone else. But Tiberius must also be understood. He simply could not help but break down. Um, if fate deprives the Philistine of titles, then it happens that the itch of vanity leads him to direct forgery. The example of Balzac, who arbitrarily added the noble particle D to his plebeian surname, is well known. For a comparison, Goethe, with his second will, having deservedly received the the excuse me, having deservedly received the nobility um, for a long time, simply signed Goethe without the aristocratic particle von. So the three V will ennoble themselves falsely, and the two V will kind of be like, eh, you know, they'll just keep it casual. Uh, Philistine is a man of the crowd. He lacks self-confidence to lead human movements and to stand on the sideline, sidelines lacks independence. Um, so the Philistine usually makes up the thickest part of social movements, their middle part. He is a ballast of society that is incredibly difficult to shift, and once shifted, it is impossible to stop. The third will loves the crowd in its own way and at first feels comfortable in it. Finding herself among her own kind, she thinks that the sum of weaklings can become a great strength which is only partly true. And besides, having entrusted her sick spirit in the crowd to something stronger and more significant than herself, the third will begins to breathe easily, b believing that she has thereby freed herself from painful responsibility for herself and others, from the painful need for daily independent choice. However, the Philistine would not be himself if, feeling the, com the comfort of dissolving his vulnerable personality in the crowd, he at the same time did not secretly rebel against it and did not strive to break out. Loss of individuality is the dream and pain of the third will. The writer uh, Zemiatin, under the impression of the 1905 revolution, wrote to his bride, But this is almost happiness. When something picks you up like a wave, rushes somewhere, and there is no longer your own will. How good. Don't you know this feeling? Have you ever swum in the surf? And 15 years later, the same um, Zemiatin, um, published the prophetic dystopian novel We, thoroughly saturated with wild horror of the advancing socialist depersonalization. Let's give it its due. The Philistine is talented like no one else, and there are, are at least three reasons for this. Firstly, the position of the remaining functions on the levels of the mental hierarchy gives him strength and freedom in any type of creativity. The Philistine has a problem with the engine of creativity, will, but the entire set of tools for various operations, intellectual, artistic material, is completely free. Secondly, the subtlety of the psychic organization of the third will as a whole gives this creativity a refined flavor. Thirdly, the third will is talented simply because it is secretly but wildly and insatiably ambitious. Finally, most importantly, the typical Philistine dislike for oneself and others a critical view of the world are an ideal creative stimulus that allows one to find shortcomings, uh, the possibility of change where other wills, um, I guess, would not see them. The translation cuts off, but they they find um, they're stimulated, um, their creativity is stimulated by um, their ability to find shortcomings and possibilities of change where other wills would not see them. It may seem that there is some contradiction in the statement about the possibility of talent in the absence of a strong personal core, but in reality there is no contradiction here. Berdiev wrote, Andre Belli, an unusually bright, original, and creative individuality, said to himself that he had no personality, no I. Sometimes it seems that he was proud of this. Uh, this only confirmed for, for me the differences between individuality and personality. Absolutely rightly noted. 
The brightness of an individual is not a guarantee of a strong personality, and powerful talent is not necessarily identical to a powerful eye. Or as Fina Renev Renevskaya brilliant, brilliant, yeah, brilliantly put it, talent like a pimple can jump up on your butt. Okay. Oh man, this section might be longer than uh, first will. I forgot about that. At the same time, there was a limit to the talent of the Philistine, invisibly outlined by his own third will. Despite all the vagueness of uh, panegyric terminology, which is unable to separate talent from talent and talent from genius, I think it's supposed to be like talent from skill and talent from genius, we can say with confidence that the path of, the, the path of genius of genuine revelation is not a Philistine path. The fact is that the creativity of the third will is certainly accompanied by an element of pop, opportunism, i.e. internal deployment to the opinion of the crowd, an element of fear of public evaluation, hanging like a weight on his hands. No matter how radical the Philistine may appear in art, science, or production, he always knows that he is not alone, but in a certain crowd and fulfills a certain social order. The inability to achieve true independence is the problem of the third will, not only in every, everyday life, but also in creativity. Let me take a sip. The outer side of the mental appearance of the third will is well conveyed in one description of Gogol made by his contemporary. In the whole figure, there was something unfree, compressed, crumpled into a fist. No scope, nothing open anywhere, not in one movement, not in one look. The internal lack of freedom and crumpled spirit characteristic of the third will manifested in facial expressions and plasticity are indeed very typical. But the look is especially noticeable. It, as in all their cases, is the most striking external sign of the third will. More precisely, its elusiveness. The degree of secrecy of the gaze of the third will varies depending on the depth of the ulcer according, according to the third. The shifting eyes, often described in literature, are quite rare. They are the destiny and sign of an extreme degree of wounding of the will. More often, the Philistine has the same expression in his eyes that Gorky describes when talking about Yesenin. All that was left of the curly-haired toy boy were very clear eyes, and even they seemed to have burned out in some, bright, in some too bright sun. Their restless gaze slid over people's faces, changeable, sometimes defiant and disdainful, sometimes suddenly uncertain, embarrassed, and distrustful. It seemed to me that in general he was unfriendly towards people. I will add the typical of the third will is, is unsteady, elusive, as it were, floating look. Usually you don't pay attention to this elusiveness of the gaze. You never know what can attract someone else's gaze, except your own person. And only then, sometime later, you discover that after prolonged communication with a person, you still cannot say what color his eyes are. The third will knows that there is something wrong with her eyes, and sometimes resorts to various kinds of disguises. Most often in such cases, black glasses are used. This practice is old, dating back to when only the blind wore black glasses. It was said about one gifted immigrant poet, he was an excellent speaker, and this despite his extremely unattractive appearance, the appearance of a blind man, hence the black glasses hiding his seemingly blind eyes. He, however, sees perfectly. He himself must be, was aware of the strange impress, impression made by his eyes, and never took off his black glasses. After all, eyes are the mirror of the soul, but his eyes were hardly the mirror of the soul. These were strange, unpleasant eyes, that made a simply repulsive impression on many. They did not reflect his soul at all, the soul of a poet. Uh, his dark glasses, however, were sometimes useful. In the subway and on buses, even during busy times, there was always a seat for him, give way to the blind man. There are inventions that are more interesting than black glasses. Stalin found an almost brilliant way out of the situation, a tube, meaning a pipe. Constantly manipulating his pipe, now filling it, now cleaning it, now lighting it, which constantly went out, he could squint his eyes as much as he wanted. The elusiveness of his gaze, in this case, always looked quite natural. Another reliable external sign of the third will lies in the sour, alienated, angry expression that Philistine's most, Philistine most often puts on his face, which, it must be admitted, greatly spoils the unusually attractive facial features of the Philistines. The Marquis de Custine, um, de Custine, I don't know how to pronounce it, accurately described this expression on the handsome face of Nicholas I. 
he reported, at the first glance at the sovereign, a characteristic feature of his face involuntarily catches the eye, some kind of restless severity. A uh, physiognomist, not without reason, claimed that hardness of the heart harms the beauty of the face. The vocabulary of the third will, apparently by analogy with the internal state, is of, no of a noticeably reduced nature. It is rich in slang, thieves' words, and simply swearing. In general, the third will has a special talent as a scolder, an offender a bore. No one is gifted at insulting words as, as Philistine. I knew one orthodox metropolitan who, with one phrase, knocked out people almost unknown to him. The third will is the thinnest psychic membrane, and the combination of this membrane with a predilection for low, abusive, merciless words makes the Philistine a terrible opponent in verbal battles. A very reliable sign of the third will can be considered the noticeably reduced forms of address of the Philistine to loved ones. Of course, these forms vary depending on the language and people. As for the Russian Philistines, they like to they liked to address loved ones either by a reduced form of the name, Ninka, Petka, etc., or by their last name. Remember the textbook Chekhov's Jumping Lady, uh, Demo. Not sure um, about Chekhov's thing there. According to his tastes, a Philistine, forgive the tautology, is a classic bourgeois. His imminent dependence on other people's opinions, on the environment, on society, make the Philistine a hostage to fashion. Moreover, fashion in its most banal, most impersonal form. And this hostage does not only uh, harden, sorry, and this hostage does not, not only, <laughs> man, and this hostage not only does not burden the third will, but is sometimes capable of giving it genuine satisfaction. I remember how my first impressions of the army of one of my friends struck me when he said almost with enthusiasm, can you imagine? I'm bald and everyone around me is bald. I'm in green and everyone is in green. I liked it so much. It's amazing that I heard this confession from the lips of a professional artist. Or here's another extremely expressive confession made in an interview by the famous pop singer George Michael. When asked why there was such boring furniture in his house, he replied, I prefer, I prefer boring furniture. Who knows, maybe next to some priceless object, I would look completely ordinary. My furniture should not have much, should not have more character than myself. A, re a real revelation, stunning in its completeness, uh, capacity, and accuracy of presentation <clears throat> of the taste preferences of the third will. Just like taste in general, let us remember that in House of Gogol's uh, Sobakevich, the furniture shouted, and I, and I am Sobakevich. Our tastes are in our tastes are us in their material expression, and everything our hand touches bears the imprint of our psyche. So yeah, pretty good. Um, I think you just gotta kind of, you know, understand he's he's presenting this extreme ideal uh, so that you get it, um, and you just kind of gotta tone it down, you know, by like twenty or thirty percent or something. To get a more usual, to get the more normal picture of the, you know, usual third will type who is not this, like, you know, complete asshole figure. Um, but yeah, anyway, that was probably the longest one. Um, and yeah, so next time we'll do surf fourth will.